Hello and welcome to episode number eight of the Neil and Amy podcast. This is a show about helping people find joy in the middle of challenges because life is too short to live miserable. We're in a series called Wayfinder. That's because we're launching a book. It's our first book and it's all about helping people find their way in life and to overcome obstacles. Right now, if you go to neilandamy.com, we are offering 20% off as a pre-sell on this book. We're hoping that the actual production of it will take place sometime early November. And in addition to that, we're actually offering the audio version of this book as well for free just by pre-ordering this now. Today's episode, we're uh, the big idea is this. It's it's all about how quiet time leads to being independently sound. And before we jump into that, I want to make mention, and I, I said this the last week in our in our episode, that my wife, Amy, is actually not with us today. I have Eric sitting across from me here. He's the awesome producer of this show. And um, and Amy just this last week had a procedure, had a surgery. So what we thought would be cool, this is all the genius Eric's idea, <laughs> is to is to call Amy in and just do a quick little check in with her. What do you think, Eric? I, I think that's a great idea. Awesome. All right, let's try to get her on the line. All right, dialing now. Hello. Well, hello, pretty lady. How are you? Hi. So I'm hanging in, hanging <laughs> in, um, Eric set up what's actually going on right now. Okay. So we are upstairs recording the podcast and Amy is in her recovery bed downstairs <laughs> and we just called her into the show, her own show. Yeah. <laughs> My own show. She's our first <laughs> guest on our own show via Colin. So honey. Oh. Kind of update mm -hmm. the audience on how your last week went. I did mention in the last episode that you were having a hysterectomy procedure, which is a little yep. different to do at the age of 38, but go ahead and yep. throw out how you're doing and give everybody an update. Um, well, we went in thinking we were going to be able to do more of a partial hysterectomy and and ended up uh, having to do pretty much almost a full one. And being in the hospital during COVID is the worst thing ever. I I can't I can't even put into words what what a horrible experience it was. Um, I had to come out of surgery all by myself and then stay in the hospital for I think I was total the hours there, I think I was total like 30 or 32 hours there by myself, which doesn't sound like a lot when you think, you know, a day and some hours, but when you're in the worst pain of your life and the nurses are understaffed, so it takes them 30 minutes after you hit the call button for them to actually show up in your room and we're just laying in a bed in the most pain I've ever been in. I, I would, if I had to redo it, I'd give birth to Bradley King and Quincy all over again. At the same time. Possibly <laughs> back to back instead of having to go through what I went through. I don't know what happened, but I had some kind of bad reaction to the medication. And on top of having an incision on my lower belly, that's probably like six inches wide, um, I then was throwing up, which any woman who knows what it's like to throw up when you're pregnant, it's horrible. So it's similar to that, but minus the open wound. Mm -hmm. And um, that was terrible. And at that point, I think I had a me mental breakdown. And then you and mama came. My mom surprised me and showed up, which I'm forever in debt for for that because... I did not know that it was going to be as bad as it was going into it, not to be Debbie Downer, but you know, it's one thing when you know you're going into something hard and you have your mind all geared up for it. But then when you get there and it's like 25 times worse than what you thought it was, uh, sometimes your brain doesn't have time to prepare to handle the weight of that. And mine definitely did not. So getting home was like, the thing that I needed to do the best 
the fastest, but because of COVID, they had to make me stay in there. They made me do a COVID test before surgery and just a bunch of hoops to jump through. And then um, when you and mom picked me up at the hospital, just crazy. They didn't even let you and mom like in the hospital pick me up. Like they literally wheeled me out to the sidewalk and then you guys could pick me up. Um, so insane. And came home. Um, the kids made me uh, he put my bed in the dining room, set up a TV for me and now I kind of look like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory parents in the house. <laughs> and and they gave you a special award. And they, they did give me a special award. I always wanted a Dundee Award, so now I have my own Dundee Award sitting on my nightstand. Oh, and it like, says, what's that from? Congratulations, <laughs> the office. Congratulations, um, your periods and pain are officially Dundee. <laughs> 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 the periods, yes, pain maybe in a few weeks, hopefully. What? The pain's not quite Dundee because you're under oh, a yeah. ton of that right now. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and the the pain meds, they do not help. I'm real I really am surprised. I thought for sure I was like, Oh, at least I'll get the best sleep of my life during the surgery and it's like the pain meds don't even you know what it's like? It's like when you have a migraine and you take a Tylenol, it doesn't even, like it's two separate yeah, it doesn't sides touch of the it. spectrum. It doesn't even touch it. And I really thought that I hear of all these people getting addicted to pain meds and stuff. And I'm like, how in the world could you get addicted to this? It's not even doing anything. It's so, literally like nothing. I, I don't know if that's because the pain is so high or it my body just doesn't react well to pain meds. I don't know what the deal is, but it's been a journey to try to breathe through constant pain. Constant pain, which isn't kind of crazy. I'm looking at the words on my screen that say life's too short to live miserable. And mm -hmm. you physically for at least the last 10 years, right? Have mm -hmm. been in many ways, living miserable, um, you know, at, throughout different times of the month. And, mm -hmm. and that misery kind of got to the point where it was like, okay, we literally can't handle this anymore. And it's kind of crazy because well, it we all had jumped through all the hoops that they, you know, they, no, but no doctor is like wants to do a full hysterectomy on a 30 year old. Right. So, or a 28 year old. So it's like, okay, well, we'll wait until your kids are a certain age and then we'll look at options, you know. And then, you know, you jump through those steps and they do the ablation and they do whatever they can without having to actually do the hysterectomy. But then finally it just came down to that I couldn't couldn't cope anymore with it. And it, I think it just progressively got worse as well. And you know that, that two weeks ago we did an episode called A Line Had to Be Drawn. Mm -hmm. And that was literally the day after where it was like, that's, that's it. You know, like there's no, mm -hmm. no more on this particular one. And then within a matter of days, your doctor actually did, you know, the ultrasounds and all of that mm -hmm. and saw what was happening and was like, okay, you know, this is, this is important. You know, your, your ovaries are hemorrhaging. It's time to go you know, get this accomplished. And then when mm -hmm. I talked to him just after the surgery, I'm assuming it's not too personal to share this, but um, he he actually said, well, he, he only thought he was going to have to remove one of the two ovaries. And he looked and he was, said, no, like this is, they're bad. He said that they they literally were obliterated, you know, had, had mm -hmm. really deteriorated and must have been that way for quite a little while. And so um, he removed both of them and um, and it was like very important to do so. But that, mm -hmm. that contributed, you know, the, how bad that was. It contributed over the last couple of years to all the pain. Yeah. So it was interesting, too, that he said that um, my intestines had somehow got connected. connected or something to, like, the uterus or I don't know, whatever it is. And he said it basically was like they had, they had almost glued to it. So he, yeah. he had to separate which is probably why my whole insides right now feel like 
I've been kicked in the gut by Hulk Hogan for a day and a half. Maybe this is where the Offspring song, it's kind of random, right? Offspring, you know, the group mm-hmm. Offspring, it's kind of like where the, you know, the ovaries and the uterus and the fallopian tubes, that's all where the Offspring comes from. Mm-hmm. And then they had that hit song called You Got Eric. I'm trying to think. You got to keep them separated. Yeah. <laughs> Amy? Yeah, it probably is. No, I mean, it no would definitely laughs. be helpful. <laughs> I can't laugh. If I laugh right now, my guts are like, I feel like I'm going to fall open. Oh, my. Eric, toward the end of the song, you should totally cue, or end of the show, you should cue up over this thing. You got to keep them. Yeah. Up. All right. Now people think I'm mean. <laughs> yeah. You don't know. How, like, you think you're trying to be, like, all friendly and nice and make jokes, and you're just being ornery and then I can't laugh about anything. So <laughs> yes, <we just> look- <laughs> yes, because we've been like, one, we couldn't be in the hospital together. And so we literally just kept each other on speakerphone the entire night. Like there was no, like it was just on all night long. So we would just kind of like unmute, mute and just talk just as if we were in the room together. And so it's, you know, been a few days of this and Amy and I's relationship is one. I mean, she likes to tease and I like to tease, but I like to do it earlier in the day and she typically does later <laughs> in the day. So I started bringing it kind of early yesterday. And by the end of the day, she's like, that's enough. Like no more teasing me. Like this is not. <laughs> yeah. I feel like I should get one of those um, cards that like you, makes you have to be, do something different. I don't know what that's called. Immunity. Maybe. I don't know either. But you could yeah, write one well, up. I guess in one sense, I'm glad I didn't know what I was about to go through because mm. I don't know. But at the same, in the same sense, I'm going to be happy when this six weeks is up. For sure. Yeah, not knowing what you're going into kind of eases your mind a little bit going into it, kind of thinking, oh, mm-hmm. it's going to be not so bad on the other side of this and yeah yeah so you weren't as stressed going into it but man on the other right. side of it it was pretty rowdy my heart goes out to all the elderly people in the hospital right now because there is something to be said about eye contact and touch when you're like in a desperate state and i mean it's proven you can look it up <laughs> look it and up. not having that can really decrease just your overall health and being. And it's very sad that that is being taken away from individuals because it's like one of the things that keeps you going. I couldn't agree more with that. For sure. We, we heard early on in, uh, in the COVID pandemic whatever you think about this, it's still affecting people's lives, you know? And um, there's one lady that we know who her father went into the hospital not long after COVID and it didn't seem to be all too serious, but he ended up having to be hospitalized for like two months and they never let a family member in there ever. And he ended up passing away in the hospital. So they just dropped him off for like a check-in and then never got him back. It's so sad. Mm -hmm. It's so sad. And it, it just, it doesn't really make a lot of sense because the amount of people that I was exposed to in the hospital while I was there that I could be getting COVID from was very high. And someone that I'm with, you know, uh, you were together all day. That's and, me. yep, share a bed together. And, you know, they're worried that you're going to bring COVID in, but you're a hospital, you have all of these people that already have COVID in here, it's like, that. Does, okay, that doesn't make sense. Well, then are you going to be a threat to me in surgery? Well, no, because you and I, you just dropped me off for surgery. Right. And they had it's to do like, a test on you, which they yeah, could they have had done to run a easily COVID a test. test on me, just the same. Right. You know? Easily. And, and even the nurses yeah. were saying it's so nice, for the most part, having family members present because the family members help alleviate some of the pressure on the nurses Mm -hmm. well and and the bigger portion is 
you know, I, I probably had six or seven nurses during the time that I was there. And I, this one young man, um, he was very kind and he was saying that just the emotional support that having a loved one in the room, like they're not really doing anything for you. The nurses are taking care of you. Um, but he said that that is like such a big thing for the patients. And he said he wished so badly that they could just have like one person that, you know, you they get checked and then they get put in the room and you stay in the room with me, you don't leave. And um, because just the, just the essence and the spirit of the, the patient, you know, goes higher having that kind of presence, which is yep. kind of what you're going to talk about here in a little while. That's true. That is so true. Well, I think we should let you continue to rest. Thank you for being the first guest on the Neil and Amy show. What was your name again? My name's Amy Lyons Preston. My oh. birth date is six four eighty two. Don't give them your social. I had to re- <laughs> I had to repeat that like at least one hundred and fifty times in the last forty eight hours. Ah, well, you should get back to watching Matlock, Doctor Phil, and what other th- what other favorite do you have? A TV show. Yeah, Matlock and Doctor oh, Phil. Oh no, I like watch. I don't watch Doctor Phil. I like or to watch Matlock. The Resident. No, I actually did like Matlock. When I was a little kid, I was a junkie on... Uh, you were a junkie what, on the Matlock MacGyver. And the, the MacGyver, MacGyver. And, and the girl with the red hair, and she's the voice on the teapot of Beauty and the Beast. What's her name? I have she no had clue. A, she was like a private investigator. Come on, Eric. You should know this. Your mom probably watched it. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking. I'm, I'm trying. Yeah. You know, Amy, my... I think I know what kind of cards you were talking about earlier, though. It's a yellow yeah. card, like in soccer. So yes. when Neil's being honorary, you just pull that yellow card. Pull my yellow card. <laughs> and... Can you get me one, please, since I can't walk around? Yeah, I can do that. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. I'll get you a red card, too. Ooh. Awesome. But can I awesome. get a green card? <laughs> you, you, oh. I, no. <laughs> That's off limits, <laughs> at least for six weeks. Oh, I think that sounded sexual. It was sexual. <laughs> All right, I love you guys. All I'm right. going to try to go to sleep. Okay, talk to you in a bit. Bye, love Amy. You. Toodles. Bye-bye for now. All right. So what do you think, Eric? Should we jump in? Yeah. Awesome. So today we're tackling a subject and, you know, the heart behind this, this podcast is that we genuinely are wanting you, the listener to overcome. We're wanting you to succeed. We're wanting you to win in all of your circumstances. And even as Amy and I were just talking momentarily or just a few minutes ago, uh, it's life's tough. Like you go through some hard things, like pain is a part of the you know, process of just being alive, unfortunately. And, uh, and so because of that, we all can either shrink back in the face of opposition, shrink back in the face of struggle, or we can rise above and we can learn to grow and develop. And last week, Eric was asking a number of questions, questions that we get asked kind of frequently. Um, that was just this last episode, things about balance, priorities, all of those types of questions. And one, I, I can't remember exactly how the question was worded, but it I think it had to do with like something that I just personally couldn't have done without. Was that a thing? Yeah, I think it was, um, you know, one, what was one thing in your, in your past that you, that was crucial that you couldn't have succeeded without? Yeah. And I threw out people, you know, having good people around me. And I threw out just this deep desire and searching or seeking. Um, but today, and, and this is truly a, what we would say, big rock. Today, I want to talk about something that is of equal importance. And it's actually, I would say, it was, it's kind of like an action that you take as somebody who is searching or seeking. It's an action that you take as somebody who is searching or seeking. And every single one of us, we believe that we should all be searching and seeking and looking for a deeper connection in life, a deeper meaning to life. And, and that to us means that 
you know, you have to wrestle with the question, does, like, was I put on this earth by chance randomly or was I put on this earth by more of like a divine intelligence? We can call that divine intelligence God, the creator, you know, however you, you want to term it. Um, we are of the Christian faith. We um, believe that that um, is the way. And because of that, we want to help people find that way. Um, therefore, we want to take some of those things that we have learned and we want to teach, train. That is our heart is, is to teach and train uh, you, the listener, the, you know, the person who's following this and how to live a more uh, peaceful, successful, joyful life and to do it through some of these tools. And so a seeker or a searcher, somebody who's looking uh, for for meaning and looking for meaning, um, you know, from from uh, from the Creator, the term quiet time or being still is a very very important component. And so, what we want to talk about today is how quiet time leads to being independently sound. Now, that needs a little bit of unpacking. The quiet time might be simple enough just to state it as it is, but. Um, independently sound and being independently sound is really an important facet. And that's kind of what the the direction of this uh, training, the show is actually going to be about today. So I want to pose the question to you, what makes you sound? What does that even mean? What does it mean to be sound? What makes you sound? Or let's, let's ask this question another way. What keeps you sane? You know, the opposite of being sane would be like uh, Cypress Hill back in the day, Eric, remember it? Yeah, insane in the membrane. <laughs> insane in the brain, right? Insane in the membrane, meaning, man, I've lost my mind. I'm, I've gone crazy. I've lost it. I'm insane. So what keeps you sane or sound, right? What What is it? Does it? So for some, uh, let's just... Let's just, you know, some of us and I being one, there have been many times in my life where substances have been the the thing that I've used to help keep me sane, which in reality is probably insane more than it's sane because eventually substances lead to, you know, insanity, right? They lead to, um, you know, things breaking down and falling apart. But in the moment, right, they help you feel, you know, maybe checked out or, you know, more stable, if you would, even though it's really the exact opposite of that. So, um, you know, what, what are other things? Can you think of anything, Eric, that kind of pop, like things that people would use to keep sane? Uh, work. Dude, that's a good one. Yeah, workaholic. Yep. Uh, hobbies. Yep. Um, internet forums. Ooh. <laughs> okay. Are, are you seeing any threads within those things that are kind of like similar threads? That Dis- Yeah, they're distractions. Right. Distractions from? Your actual life. Yeah. Boom. Boom. There it is. All right, that'll do it for episode... No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) That's exactly right. So the things that keep you sound, the things that keep you sane, Eric decided a few of them. Work, hobbies, internet forums. For some people, maybe video games. Uh, Other people, it's just like bouncing from relationship to relationship to relationship. Like we're searching for meaning. We're searching for all those things. And ultimately, all of those things are simply distractions from your actual life. From your actual life. And sometimes it's, you know, difficult to take life just as it is. So we look for things to occupy our minds so that we don't have to deal with reality. And that right there can lead to a pretty rough journey because if we don't quickly decide to own up to what life is actually about, then in many ways we just prolong things. And I can tell you, Many, many, many instances where I've sat with people that are at their deathbed or near their deathbed in their 60s, 70s, 80s, and they had never wrestled with the question of what is life actually about. What they did is they spent their entire life journeying through, you know, they were taking care of the kids and then they went into, you know, their work and they were just fully focused on the work and they built this dynasty and then they built the house and then they went into retirement and the next thing you know, cancer came. Oh, no, now cancer came in. Now they're starting to wrestle with life and death and some of those bigger questions. And at that point, then they start to look back over their life and they start to say, oh, no, did I miss it? 
Did I miss the actual meaning of life? Was I just distracted this entire time? Did, was I preoccupied with things that really weren't that important? And so it's very easy for us to get our sanity or to, you know, to become sound people. Actually, Eric, later this after this, we're going to go do a sound practice, right? You, you <laughs> back in the day, use probably guitar. I, like, I'd like to play hoops and things like that. But you, like, maybe musical instruments and things could have been something yeah. that helped keep you sound. For sure, for sure. My whole life. Yeah. yeah. And I don't think that's a bad thing. Like, I personally think that... Hobbies aren't bad. Obviously, work's not bad. Internet forums are not bad, although there, sh- there could be some that might not be good. Al-Qaeda, things like that. <laughs> <laughs> You've never been on any Al-Qaeda forums, have you? No. <laughs> um, what a, so do you think that this comes back to balance then? I really do. I think yeah. it comes back to balance and priority. Um, as we were talking about last week. So that's where I think we're just kind of piggybacking a little bit off of that. Um, We could have dug way deeper into that subject. And, um, you know, as we journey this forward, we're going to give opportunities for you, the listener, to uh, get more like in-depth practical stuff on that. But right now we're really trying to get you to search. We're trying to get you to seek and to dig into, um, into, into who you are, where you're at and what you're trying to do. So, um, you know, distractions in and of themselves aren't bad. Music obviously is not bad. You know, building things not bad. None of that's bad unless it becomes all consuming and it takes you away from actually what matters most. Mm -hmm. Then it becomes bad because that distraction has caused you to, you know, not do what's most important. It would be very similar to, you know, building a house and really focusing on the roof. Like you're going to build the best roof ever so it doesn't ever, ever rain, but you never actually built a super solid foundation. And if you if you don't build the really, really, really stout foundation, then that roof doesn't really matter because all that's going to happen is the water is going to shed off the roof and then it's going to drop down to the foundation and it's going to erode the foundation and then eventually the house is going to fall over anyway and your beautiful shingles are just going to be laying flat in the dirt. And so it's that same kind of a principle that we're trying... These are foundational principles. These are principles that if you build... With these principles, then then the other things, you know, the the roofs, the doors, the windows, the all of those things, then they can be in their proper seat. They can be in their proper place. And that, to me, is it. It's like work work can destroy a family because men or women can be overly consumed by it and they can neglect their relationships. And that has happened. It happened in my family. Um, it, it's happened in many families that I know, and it's probably happened to many families that you know. And so the problem there is not work. The problem is overly focusing on something that is not quite as important. So we need to bring it back to reality. And I believe that if you, the listener, are struggling in any area of your life, and I know that this is going to sound crazy, but I believe that this principle that we're talking about today is truly the one thing that changes everything. I like to say it like that. It's the one thing that changes everything. It's the secret sauce, right? And, and, and it's the secret sauce because it has to do with seeking, right? It has to do with connecting, and it has to do with foundational principles. So these foundational principles, if they're placed in your life and you, and you genuinely connect your heart and your mind to them, then you will not be insane in the membrane. You'll actually, you know, you'll actually be in a place of sanity and health, and you'll be building it upon a, a strong foundation because that's what matters most. So... Many of you know, and we've, we've already said this, and you know, Amy and I have been pastors, and that means pastors in a, in a Christian church for the last about really 18 or so years since we were pretty young, honestly, probably almost started too young. And we love to help people. That is truly our heart. In fact, we say our life mission is to help people find their call and make life count because life is meant to be enjoyed and it's way too short to live miserable. But the problem that we've seen over the years is that people oftentimes rely too heavily on us or they rely too heavily on others or on things to the extent that, you know, even, you know, we we as people could become a crutch for others. We could enable people because we're just constantly, you know, providing whatever it is that people need for them. And so the context of this 
episode is that we don't want to be a crutch, right? We want to absolutely do our very best to help people stand in what we will say is an independently sound life. And that doesn't mean they don't have relationships around them. It doesn't mean that at all. In fact, quite the contrary. But the independently sound means that I don't have to get everything else from other people. I have learned to actually fish rather than for people to put fish on my plate every day, right? That's, that's kind of the idea of that. And so I was thinking about the, the glasses illustration we were talking about earlier. Like it, it, if we're using a crutch too much and glasses can be a great illustration of that, then essentially sometimes we become more dependent on that. Eric, do you have any thoughts on that or examples of that? Oh, well, yeah, the thing with glasses is, um, you know, when people, most, a lot of times when people first get glasses, you know, it's not like they're completely blind. They just need a little help seeing. But then after they've been wearing glasses for a long time, then if they don't have them, then they're basically can't see anything. Right. And year by year, they go back for a checkup and then, oh, got to get a little bit stronger. And that just continues to kind of deteriorate. And we see that a lot of times with enablement, with people, with society. We see that in our country. You know, there. I, I was told one time that a friend, um, he, well, it actually was an uncle of mine. He worked within the police departments, and and when you know when checks just show up in the mail, and this isn't. I'm not saying this because I'm trying to knock anybody who's receiving a check in the mail from the government. But when checks do show up in the mail. It trains even the children to think, well, wait a second, why would I have to go out and work if we just hang out here and then the check shows up in the mail? You know, it's that it's that enablement mentality. So um, we want to really like focus now kind of around this idea of how quiet time and I'll break that down a little bit more. Quiet time is truly exactly what it says. It's it's eliminating distractions and it's finding a space where you can actually take your mind into a place where you can connect with your yourself you can connect with life's purposes you can connect with the the spirit of the creator and you can become in some sense one with the one who made you in order that you can actually live your life in the direction that you were meant to live it. And and that's what, when we say quiet time, and there's a lot of tips and tricks that we'll bring eventually to the table for this, but that's what we're talking about when we say how quiet time actually will lead you to being independently sound. So back in the day, <laughs> there was a time where Amy and I, early, you know, it, I would, well, I'd say not that early, maybe 10 years ago, where we were just out running amok. We were trying to help as many people as we could. And we were even doing that in some sense to the detriment of our own well-being. We were, we were not even as, as focused on taking care of ourselves as we were on taking care of others. And just yesterday, um, one of our leaders and mentors sent a voice memo to Amy saying, Amy, put the air mask on yourself. You know, when you get into an airplane, uh, it says, you know, the, the instructions, you know, from the stewardess, they're always saying, make sure you put the air mask on yourself and then you put the air mask on somebody else. And I remember looking at my brother as a kid, you know, we'd fly by ourselves up to Montana at times. We were like eight to 10, 12 years old. And I remember saying, Cody, I would never do that. I will absolutely put the air mask on you first, brother, and then I will put it on myself. And it just seems so selfish to me to like put the air mask on myself when when my brother's right there and he can't put it on himself. And, and so that mentality, it's like the savior mentality that gets built deep down inside some, some people, not a lot, not everybody has that mentality. And I'm not saying if you don't have that mentality that you're wrong, but the savior mentality is, is I'm going to sacrifice myself in order to save you. Right. Where the opposite of that is, is I'm going to save myself and sacrifice you. Both of those, I think, can be detrimental. They can be very damaging. So you got to have a balance in that. And at this time in our lives, Amy and I's lives, we were very much so trying to give of ourselves, give of ourselves, and constantly trying to help others. And um, and we did that to the point of enablement of others. Now, I want to also point out that oftentimes, and this isn't the case for everybody. In fact, I don't even think it's close to the case for the majority 
of leaders, pastors, people who are in the thought leadership world that want to help, personal development people, all of that, um, spiritual mentors. Most of the people are not necessarily this way, but I do know many who are, which is we or that, that person wants others to actually need them. Because when they are needed, they feel important. When they are needed, they feel like they're the hero, like they're the rescuer. And maybe they weren't very like, you know, maybe they didn't have the best childhood or they, you know, whatever it was that happened in their life early on, they didn't, you know, they needed to be needed. And so I think sometimes, you know, leaders will actually keep other people connected kind of like a like a nursing child right on on the on the tit of a of a mama they'll do that with the people that they're leading they'll keep them just suckling on them and not actually teach them to get off the tit and actually you know actually like live a mature life and that is detrimental that's sad and it actually leads to like spiritually immature like infants babies but it's funny because they're like 80 or they're 70, or they're 50, or they're 40, and they still haven't learned to grow up. And that can be because leaders enable. It can be because leaders inhibit the progress because they want to be needed. And so it's very important to understand that that we are people who we want to teach others to connect with the Spirit themselves. We want to, rather than cause people to be just like fully dependent on us, what we're trying to do is we're trying to help people become independent and create strong, strong people who actually know how to hear from the creator themselves, know how to discern what the voice of of the spirit is in order that they can take next right steps in their lives in order that they can grow and develop and become mature. So we want people to know and feel like they have everything that they need to make it without other people necessarily. And I I think back when, um, when last week, week before, I've referred to the Wayfinder book and how Donnie, one of the first things we had Donnie do was watch the lone survivor. And that almost seems depressing. Like, what in the world? Uh, Okay, so day one, the guy, you know, attempted to kill himself that morning and then that very same day, we're like, hey, you know, you're going to have to kind of suck it up because ultimately you're, you're the lone survivor here. So go sleep on the trampoline in our backyard and watch this movie on the iPad, right? And so he watched the movie Lone Survivor. Well, the heart behind us saying that is you have to have absolute tenacity. You have to have the will to want to. You've got to fight to actually want to live in this life. And if not, you're going to get rolled over. That's what's going to end up happening. And so that idea of, of the lone survivor, he was all by himself. He was stuck out in the, you know, on the other side of the enemy lines, and he had to figure out how to fend off the enemy and then get back to safe territory. And that's, that's what many of us have to do. So in order to do that, you need tools. And quiet time is a tool to help accomplish that very thing. So back to the story. So 10-ish years ago, maybe a little longer, we were seeking to simply help a specific couple and their family. And we decided, you know, we're going to raise money for them. So we raise, you know, as much money as we could in a weekend. We go down, we give them the, the money, and, uh, and, and it's in the form of this check. And, and right out the gate, the signs started to become very apparent that, wait a second, they're just looking for help from us, and they're not necessarily looking to completely help themselves. And so... What we did is we, we provide this and then right out the gate, you know, our kids walk up, they're super excited to deliver this check. I'm just sitting in the car and, and watching the kids deliver this. And, and then, you know, they, they weren't really welcomed. They weren't really greeted. And, and so we thought, well, okay, well, no, no big deal. You know, let's just keep on moving forward. And, you know, we, a couple of weeks goes by and we're just checking on them and, and um, then it's time to move. So we show, we show up and we're at their house at midnight, you know, with, our kids who are sleeping in the car and, and we're piling things onto to trailers and we're trying to like and brought our own gear, you know, they're not having to pay for moving vehicles or anything, pile everything up and, and, and it's ready to go. And that way the next day they could go on the, their family vacation, which is awesome. We, we strongly believe in family vacations, but um, <laughs> at the same point, you know, the, as, as we're delivering all of this stuff to them, you know, trying to help them, the, the next thing was, oh, wait, well, do you think there's any room to take the trash as well? Which 
anybody, you know, all of these things are little signs like, wait a second, maybe, maybe, the, you know, they're being a little bit too dependent on us here. Um, maybe, so, so, you know, we help them move and then a little while, you know, a couple, I think maybe six, eight months later, we help them move again. And then I think one more time we, we help them move again. And it boils down at the end of our relationship that they determine that they are um, not wanting to be in relationship with us because in some sense we just weren't kind enough and we didn't help them enough. It's like, well, um, I've, I don't know that there are very many people in this world that I've ever helped more, but it wasn't good enough. And they were classic examples of people who were overly dependent on the system, overly dependent on us, to the detriment, right? To the detriment of their own well-being and the well-being, I would say, of their kids and the well-being of our organization. It, it even hurt us. It, was, it hurt our kids, but it was a great lesson. It was a lesson that kind of taught us that, wait a second, like we've got to teach people in many ways to fend for themselves. We've got to teach people to be, now we believe in helping people, but we can also over help people too. What do you think, Eric? Yeah, I, I agree with all of that. I saw it like very rarely do I see Eric get tenacity in his eyes like, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and when I was sharing that story with him, it was like, I could kind of see it in his eyes a little bit like, oh, yeah, it's not, those, those aren't the funnest stories to recall, but at the same time, there are great lessons that come from those stories, and, and truly, our prayers are with those people. I hope and pray that they're doing well in their lives to this day. There's no ill will at all toward that circumstance or situation. I hope that they learned as much as we learned through it, because we certainly learned a lot. Um, you know, when, when I was, uh, younger, not that much younger. I used to work my, my job at the family business at the family grocery stores that I, I ran one of the markets for my dad and, um, I would come home and this is so funny because the kids were little, I'm talking like Caden, like four or five, Bradley, like six, seven ish. And I would come home and Amy be folding laundry on the couch and as I would walk in and I would smell food cooking and I'd be like, hmm, well, Amy's there. And I hear her wrestling around in the kitchen. I go around the corner and Bradley and Caden at this young age would have like stools and they'd be like up and they'd be like making pancakes, like legit, like making pancakes. Or the, the worst one I can recall is like actually like frying hamburger <laughs> <laughs> and like dumping the grease and doing all of these different things. Like Amy was teaching them at a very young age that they need to be able to fend for themselves, that they need to be able to cook. They need to be able to handle things if mom, you know, got sick or, and I think that that is a, is largely due to Amy's grandmother who, um, her name was Marie Lyons, uh, nanny. We've referred to her in our, in our early story time episodes. She at a very young age had to provide for her, for her siblings and her dad was a traveling salesman and he would leave and and her mom had was gone and so out of you know age of 10 12 13 years old she was having to gather and do everything that was necessary to care for a household and we live in a different day and age you know where a lot is a lot is a, is easier on us in this society than it was even just like 60 70 80 years ago because that's what was happening at that time so amy hearing these stories growing up you know, having a dad as she did was constantly trying to get our kids to learn that they can do it. They can fend for themselves. And so she would, you know, she would uh, teach them to cook or she would teach them to do any of those necessary things. And her dad would do the same thing. You know how somebody will, will be, you know, watching somebody else do some kind of a job. And, you know, let's say, let's just keep the cooking illustration going. You got the, you know, you got the professional chef in the room and they're looking at the rookie over there, you know, cooking their, their sauce up. And it's like, oh, this is tragic. (laughs) 
I'm imagining Dylan. Yes. <laughs> Art cook at a, a restaurant, Dylan, like looking over at so-and-so and like, this is just, oh, not right. And, and he, you know, getting over there, then, you know, he's got to, he's got to like, you know, the mentality is, well, let me do it for you. Not that Dylan has that mentality, but, um, but let me do it for you. And I think tragically in our society, let me do it for you has inhibited growth and progress. Would you agree with that? Yeah. And I think that just um, more generally uh, specialization, Every, everything's, everybody's supposed to be so specialized. And so they know how to do their one thing that's not probably, that's probably useful for their employer. Right. But as far as in day-to-day life, they don't know how to do anything. Right. I mean, I, be kind of deficient in the areas like other areas and and so yeah like there are times like call an expert like we're in a room right now that's not drywalled there's there's no drywall in this room we're in our family house and i'm looking up at undrywalled ceiling and there have been times where i thought oh i can do that i'm gonna drywall this and i i, I did it and i spent let's say two thousand dollars getting the drywall done and then it turns out that i could have had a professional come in and do it for 1700 bucks and save me three weeks like there are certain times where it's like count your losses, call the expert. But then there are many things in life where you cannot do that. You cannot count your losses and call the expert when it comes to quiet time. I can't say, hey, Eric, can you do quiet time for me? <laughs> because if you could, and then you can just pass on to me whatever it is that you get out of your quiet time, like pass the piece my direction. I'm, I'm more than willing to do that, by the way. Right on. I appreciate that. Absolutely. So the drywall, it's sometimes you call the expert, but in certain areas of life, you need to know how to do it. You need to know how to, how to fin for yourself. Amy's dad did an amazing job teaching his five children this. One example, Amy's brother, Jake, so there's Amy, Ashley, and Jake, and there's about eight years, I believe, between Amy and Jake. Jake was about 11-ish, 12 years old, and he helped his dad one day. Well, Tag, Amy's dad, was over at our house. He was hanging a curtain rod, and when he hung the curtain rod, he slipped, and he, I believe he broke his right foot. And his right foot was critical for lots of things. He's an engineer for the fire department, and he needed it. Well, it inhibited him from being able to do quite a few different things. He couldn't do his job. He had to do, he had to do it different. He was having to drive a long ways each day. And Jake got the bright idea that, you know what? I can do anything I set my mind to because my dad taught me that. I can do anything I set my mind to. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go out and I'm going to rig something up to help my dad drive the car. So a whole day goes by, and I remember sitting inside the house with Tag and Amy and Robin, and we were all just hanging out, and Jake came in, and he said, Hey, I've got it figured out for you. I know I, I've, I've rigged up your, your uh, Jeep, Dad. And we're like, What are you talking about? And I'm thinking, Okay, this is a 12-year-old boy who just, like, mangled his car. So we go outside, we walk over to the Jeep, and Jake had taken the, the wiring that controls the brakes off of bicycles, and he put two handles on the steering wheel. One on the left was a clutch, and the other on the right was a throttle. So there was the ability for Jake's dad, Tag, Amy's dad, to drive the Jeep with his hands and not his feet. And he was 12 years old and legitimately figured out how to do it. Because if there's a will, there's a way. And that's something that we hear a lot in society, but that is something that was drilled into my wife's family. If there's a will, there's a way. And you can figure it out and you can fend for yourself and you can get it done. And in the area of quiet time, if there's a will, there's a way. You can actually figure this stuff out. One more thing. I gotta, I'm telling a story time day. I'm telling you all kinds of different stories, but they're all going to tie back to a very specific point. So Bradley, our oldest, was little. And she was, and still is, at 19 years old today, extremely confident. If you'd have seen my text exchange with her last night, it's like she would take on Donald Trump right now if she had to without fear. And you, we all know how that could go when facing off with Donald Trump. But I think that Bradley has some serious arguing skills. So she, very headstrong at about maybe six, seven years old, first grade, same time where she's flipping hamburger and draining grease and doing all this stuff. 
she's like, hey, I'm going to I'm going to head to the store to pick up some groceries. And we're like, uh, in my mind, I'm thinking, no, you're not like one. We live in a world where like, I hate to say this, but like human trafficking is a real thing. And there's a lot of real like drugs and methamphetamine and all the stuff is rampant around the communities that we live. Like you're not just going to be some cute little girl who jumps on her bike and just strolls down. But she was like, no, I'm going to pick up groceries. And we're like, uh, okay, Bradley, you go pick up the groceries. You go for it. Right. So to this day, I think she still thinks that she did it all on her own, by the way. Bradley, I'm so sorry if you're listening to this and you find out the truth. She jumps on her bike and she just starts pedaling right on down the road. And we're a couple, we're about a mile and a half or so away from the store. She's heading down the road. And once she gets like several corners out, Amy and I jump in the car and then we trail her, right? We're just, we're just kind of watching just to make sure that she's safe, good to go. But man, she did. She rolled right in, right on into the old grocery store, went to the produce department, meat department, got everything she needed, threw them on her handlebars. You know how you just kind of drape the bags right over your handlebars. And then she just rode her bike right back home, never knew that we were ever even watching her because she was confident that she could go out and figure it out. Another time, maybe a few months later, we developed confidence that they were Bradley was okay, that she was good to go, that she had it figured out. And so we allowed her and Caden, who's two years younger, to go ahead, like you guys walk on home. So they're, they're walking home, and as they get a, you know maybe half a mile away from, from the store where I was working, dogs show up. And this dog came and essentially tried to attack the kids. And Caden, his name means spirit of battle, what he did is he picked up a stick and he said he was scared and he started fending off this dog in order to get back. And they, they ended up turning and running and making it all about, I'll never forget. They come running into the store and they're scared. They're absolutely scared, like just petrified. And I even remember one of our secretaries created an award for them, kind of like a Dundee award, but it was like they, they fought the beast and won kind of a thing. But when you, build confidence in your life, you can overcome things that come against you. And sometimes dogs show up. Sometimes ravenous wolves that want to tear you apart and leave you left for dead actually do appear in your life. And what happens when they do? Do you have the tools it takes to overcome obstacles and reach destinations? That's what this tool is about. That's what this topic is about for today. So what we really believe is rather than catching fish for others and putting them on the plate, we need to teach people to catch fish. And essentially, that's what having a solid, quiet time is. What it does is it leads to individuals being independently sound to where you can handle the business that comes against you without having to phone a friend necessarily. However, phoning a friend can be a very great idea at different times. So let's really look at a little bit more specifically, like what is this idea of quiet time? I've already said this, but it's, it's a time for seeking, but it's not only a time for seeking, it's a time for sorting. It's really important that you sort out what's happening in your life, what's happening in your mind. Otherwise, what happens is if it's not sorted out, then things are very convoluted. Sometimes, you know, if, if your life's not sorted, then you end up doing things out of order because you haven't prioritized it. It'd be like putting together, it'd be like getting a, a package, you know, at Christmas and you've got the directions there, but you're like, yeah, you know what, I just, I'm going to figure it out myself. And you go ahead and you just start putting it all together and you realize, oops, I missed a step. It was called step one. And so you're, you're not sorted. When things are sorted, and that's what directions do, it gives you a clear path in order to, to walk it out, to have as, as few missteps as possible. Because isn't it crazy how many missteps you can take in life? You're like traveling down the road, and then all of a sudden, darn it, I missed that one. Oops, better go back a little bit. That's fine, because thankfully, we're humans, and we can do that. We can always backtrack but it'd be really nice if we just stayed on track instead of having to backtrack or sidetrack so much. It'd be pretty cool. And so quiet time is a time for seeking and sorting. And I think that quiet time is a lost art in our society. 
we live in a loud world, right, Eric? Absolutely. Like most households, and I'm not anti TV. I'm not. If you look at me most of the time, if I'm by myself, I probably got my headphones in, either a podcast or tunes or something cranking. But there's always noise. There's always something that's seeking to steal our attention. In quiet time, you know, some would call it meditation. It's a time where you center. It's a time where you ground. It's a time where you come to reality. It's a time when you actually deal with your actual life. When I was much younger, and this is kind of a common practice, you know, when uh, you know, smoking pot was just a kind of a regular thing for me, we used to what we would call wake and bake. Bake. You say that like you did that. No, I never did that. You didn't do that? No, I was never too into marijuana. Okay. Did you wake in other things? Uh, not <laughs> no too pressure. Often. Not too often. <laughs> <laughs> well, in my days, we did wake and bake. And I think like a year of waking and baking went by. And it was like we pretty much were like baked most of the time. And I remember like, why would we just wake and bake? bake. It, it had to do with with just like checking out of reality. Just not it was just way more fun not to deal with life in its full flavor at that moment in time. And I'm not dogging, trust me. If you're still at a, a place of wake and bake, then bake your little heart out, right? But the but the truth is that if you get unsettled with your waking and baking, like it's just not what it's not cutting it for you anymore. It's just not doing justice. If if you know beer number two and beer number four and then beer number six if beer number six isn't as good as beer number one and you start getting to that point where it's like no this is just not satisfying anymore this is an alternative and we do try to coach this through and i'm not trying to make this about substance so much right now because we can we can be distracted by all kinds of things as we've already said so quiet time is a time to center to come back to reality to come back to your actual life and to stay in tune with where you are And so number one in quiet time is you limit all distractions. That's the number one thing. You got to limit all distractions. I've got a lot of other teaching and training, a lot of other thoughts on that subject, but I just want you to, even if you have a notebook or anything handy on your phone right now, I want you to write down this number one thing for quiet time is limit all distractions. And you, only you know what might distract you. It might be the smell of the muffin that's baking in the oven. Then get your butt away from the muffin because it's a distraction. It might be the kids that are, you know, crying in the other room. Then have somebody help with that or just do it earlier while they're still sleeping. Whatever you've got to do, you've got to limit all distractions. That's number one. Number two is you have to bring Connection resources. Hmm. What do I mean by connection resources? Resources that helped you help you center, help you connect, that help you connect with the creator. Now, here's the thing. Everybody is in a different, you know, space in their journey with the creator. For some, for some of you, you might be in a space right now where you're just trying to figure out whether or not you believe in one at all. And that's good. You're wrestling with a great question. How are you ever going to eliminate whether or not you actually believe unless you decide to actually investigate whether or not it's actually true? And so you might be in that stage of this journey. And if that's you, awesome. I'm cheering you on. If you need any help or resources, there are lots of ways that you can get in touch with us to help with that. But if that's, you you could be in that space. Or fast forward, you could be in a space where you started believing two decades ago like Neil, and now you're at a spot where it's like, nope, this is what I need to connect today. What I need to connect today is slightly different than what I needed to connect at that stage in the game. Whatever the connection resource is for you at this stage of the game, that's what you need to bring. So number one, limit distractions. Number two, 
bring connection resources. And when we say connection, that's connection with the creator and connection with your center or with your self resources. I wanna tell you what those things are currently for me. This is just what they are currently for me. But I will say all the way back, back in 1999 when my life changed at the age of 19, these resources were very similar for me back then. Number one, the thing that I choose to bring as a connection resource each day is a Bible, a Bible. And again, we'll unpack a lot of this later, but a Bible. Number two, a pen. And then a long time ago, it was a journal, something to write in. Today, I bring a traction planner, which is, is a tool that we created a number of years ago to help limit distractions. And we have very specific methods that we help limit distractions in order to get traction in our lives. So the, the connection resources I bring today, a Bible, a pen, a traction planner, and then typically my AirPods. Honestly, they're sitting right here next to me. My AirPods, because with those AirPods, I can tune out the rest of the world. In fact, the ones that I have, I don't even have to listen to anything. I can put them in my ears and I can hit a noise reduction button. And then all of a sudden I can be in a room with people and yet not in a room with people. And I can't even hear really what's going on in the room. Or other times I might put a little bit of good music in. So connection resources for me today, a Bible, a pen, a traction planner, and then my AirPods so that I can, I can cancel out noise or I can put the thoughts in my head that I want could be, you know, just random good music off of off of whatever top pop playlist, or it could be, you know, a, a worship song that helps me connect specifically with God. Any one of those things, those those are them. So number one, limit distractions. Number two, bring connection resources. Number three, listen and look to a positive future. That's where it starts to get a little challenging. Listen. Well, what am I listening for? I had a great conversation with somebody yesterday. He, he started doing this. He started bringing the Bible and all of those things, you know, the AirPods he started implementing. And he said, Neil, this is crazy. I used to think I was like waiting to hear like some kind of audible voice from outside, you know, like talking to me. And he's like, no, I actually started realizing that this is an internal voice. It's something inside me that's more of like a compass, like a guiding light, if you would. And he said, this is what I heard. So he limited distractions. He brought connection resources. He began to listen and then look to a positive future. Because sometimes we think, oh man, woe is me. It's going to be tough, going to be difficult. Life is, it is. But we believe that the creator didn't put us here to lose. He put us here to win. And he set us up for that. And so reshaping the way that we think from negativity to positivity is a very important piece to this puzzle. And then number four, make a simple plan, a very simple plan to take action steps that day. We call those like the next right steps. It could be a relationship thing that you're listening and, you know, you were listening and you heard, I fix this. It could be a financial thing. Hey, pay that. It could be a health thing. Stop eating that. White powdered donuts with jelly filling. No more. Broccoli. I'm just kidding. You get where I'm going. Take an action step. Make a simple plan. Because one step in the right direction is all that it takes to get traction in your life. That's it. So in the quiet time, limit your distractions. Write that down. Bring connection resources. Listen. Look to a positive future. And make a simple plan of action for little steps to take that day. I think that covers, Eric, what it is that I, I want to talk about with this quiet time leading to being an independently sound person, it's kind of scratching the surface of a much bigger topic, but are there any thoughts or things that you, that kind of triggered anything you want to discuss further as we transition here? Um, I was wondering if you wanted to bring up the listener stories and traction planner giveaway. Absolutely. In fact, I missed saying that at the very beginning of this episode, but no worries. So 
We are pre-selling the Wayfinder book. You can find that at neilandamy.com. However, because it's right around the first of the month, it's the first week of the month that you're listening to this, we like to, around that first week of the month, really help people get their focus for the month together. And what we have created is this traction planner. And what we are doing is we're offering a giveaway of this traction planner for stories from you that actually are all about just like maybe overcoming or how quiet time has helped you. Um, that could be things about, you know, how you were dependent upon a crutch of some sort or, you know, you eliminated a distraction and then that helped you move forward in your life in a positive way. Maybe it even is a story of how you're currently stuck right now and are needing some help overcoming. You could even use those particular stories because what we want to do is we want to begin to kind of highlight and understand what's happening among those who are listening to this. There is a chance that we could take some of that story and we wouldn't necessarily connect your name to it unless you wanted us to, but um, we could maybe share that with others in order to help others overcome obstacles and reach destinations. If you don't want us to do that, then right at the very top of your submission that you don't want this to be shared, but you do want to get into the monthly giveaway. So this month's giveaway, what we're going to be doing is giving away three traction planners. Those three traction planners are going to come to the first three stories that get submitted to info at neilandamy.com. Info at neilandamy.com. That's N-E-A-L a-N-D-A-M-I-E dot com. Info at neilandamy.com. So if you submit the story, then what we will do is we'll send you, as soon as we get it, we will send you the traction planner and you can start the progress of, of you know, getting your life on track using this tool. And we're excited to do that. All right. I think that that wraps it up. I'm not sure where Amy's going to land in this journey next week, if she's going to be able to be full flavor with us or back on the phone with us. But um, I'm really happy, uh, excited to be bringing these types of trainings and resources to you. Uh, Eric, thank you so much for partnering with us in this venture and helping produce these things. And I believe that is what we have. Any other wrap up from you, Eric? I think that covers it. I, I just want to say that, I, you know, we're interested in hearing our listeners' stories and sharing them with our audience. And so even if you're not interested in the Traction Planner, please feel free to send, your, send us your story if you want to. And uh, if you don't want us to read it on air, just write on top. Please do not re uh, read on air. And that would be wonderful. Awesome. All right. Well, we will catch you on the next episode. Life is too short to live miserable. Stay on track.